Hi, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. I'm Vishnu, and today's episode will be about how the human Y chromosome replaced that of Neanderthals. With me today, I've got Martin Peter of the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Welcome, Dr. Peter. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Okay, um, so first, could you provide us with like a brief um, background on Neanderthals? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I think the, the briefest possible way to introduce them is that they are our extinct evolutionary cousins. Um, obviously, if you would look around today and different corners of the world, you would, you would find only one group of humans. The, way the, you and I, basically. The way uh, science would describe us is anatomically modern human. Um, but if you had a time machine and you could go back 50,000 years or so, you would maybe, some people would be surprised that our ancestors, anatomically modern humans, at that time were only one of several groups of, or species of humans that uh, were running around the planet. And Neanderthals were one of them. Uh, the first time we discovered Neanderthals was around 1850 in Germany, where a group of human, a group of miners um, who were mining limestone discovered a skeleton which clearly looked human, but that human had strange features where, which were not known. People back then didn't see them around. And if you would look at a typical skull, as it's in anthropology textbooks, Neanderthals had these really thick eyebrows. Their skull was a little bit um, elongated. And so there was something strange about these people. Um, and the name Neanderthal uh, comes from the name of the valley where the mine was. That In Germany, that would be Neander Valley. And so they were called Neanderthal. Um, the funny bit that I like, a bit of history, is that the word Neander is after a German um, cleric or pastor. And the word Neander in um, Greek, I believe, is Neumann in German, which is Neumann in English, which is quite a funny name for a place where a new group of humans were discovered. Um, that was 150,000, uh, 150 years ago. And uh, since then, we have learned much, much more. Uh, I guess you could say Neanderthals are one of the, or used to be, and still are one of the hottest topics of anthropology research. Um, and to somehow summarize, it's a little difficult to put everything we have learned about Neanderthals into a short segment, but what we know is that they appeared somewhere around 400,000 years ago, somewhere in Europe and they disappeared around 40,000 years, uh, 40,000 years ago. And what is interesting about this 40,000 years uh, boundary is the fact that anatomically modern humans first appeared in Europe about 5,000 years prior to Neanderthal disappearance. And so one of the biggest topics of research in anthropology has been how much did Neanderthals and modern humans uh, interacted? Uh, did they possibly mate and have offspring, or did one of did modern humans wipe out Neanderthals? Uh, so basically, a lot of the anthropology research has been about explaining how these two group, groups of humans have interacted. And obviously, I'm biased because I study ancient DNA, uh, but I would say one of the biggest breakthroughs in anthropology came 10 years ago when people in our institute for the first time sequenced uh, an entire genome of a Neanderthal. And the big surprise that came out of that research was the fact that every human living today, which has uh, some ancestry which is non-African, so has roots outside of Africa, 
carries about 2% of their genomes coming from the Neanderthals. So you and I, uh, everybody who somehow has roots outside of Africa, because Neanderthals were species that lived outside of Africa. So all of us have about 2% of our genetic heritage, which is actually Neanderthal. Why they uh, went extinct or why they disappeared is still debated, but um, in, in some sense, they still are around because you could piece together our bits of Neanderthal DNA and somehow, at least at a genetic level, they are still around in some sense. So that would be maybe not as brief as you would hope, but it's as short as I can make it. Okay. Um, so historically, it's been difficult to isolate the Y chromosome of the Neanderthals. Um, how have Neanderthals' interactions with humans played a role in this? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, surprisingly, it's, it's not actually the fact, it's not those interactions that prevented, this, prevented us from studying Neanderthal Y chromosomes. I'll get to that point a little bit later. The reason why we couldn't study uh, their Y chromosomes is much more simpler, and that's because most of the fossils or the bones and teeth of Neanderthals we could study in the past and get enough DNA out of them were from females. And you might remember from school that Y chromosomes are co only carried by, by uh, men. It's actually the thing that makes you uh, a male during embryonic development and not a female. Uh, and so the simple reason is just that the, the only teeth and bones that had enough DNA preservation were from female, from female individuals. And so the Y chromosome uh, avoided us um, in this way. Um, the reason why um, this is the case is because um, when the individual dies and the bones um, somehow lie around in a cave or somewhere, uh, the DNA degrades really quickly. It would be very easy to get DNA out of me or you basically within the matter of hours. Um, but with ancient DNA, uh, especially when we are talking about Neanderthals that died 100,000 years ago, the DNA, the amount of DNA degrades really quickly. And so, um, we had male Neanderthal bones and teeth available for studying. Uh, we tried uh, hard to get DNA out of them, but it was never enough to get, um, to get their Y chromosomes. Um, and I guess, but you are absolutely correct in a, another sense is that what we actually sequenced from those three Neanderthals in our study is not really the original Neanderthal Y chromosome, but it's a Y chromosome of modern human group that um, admixed with those Neanderthals maybe around 200 or 300,000 years ago, which then due to um, strange uh, effect of nature becomes widespread in the Neanderthal population. And those Neanderthal Y chromosomes that we sequence are actually again, in a technical sense, originally coming from modern humans. I don't know if that makes sense. That's a little bit maybe convoluted way to answer this. But the reason why we couldn't get Neanderthal Y chromosomes is purely bad luck. There were no male uh, bones and teeth that we could study uh, and get Y chromosomes from. But when we actually did get their Y chromosomes, we realized that these are originally modern human Y chromosomes. Got it. Um, so you called it a strange effect of nature, but why do you think that the, the human Y chromosome was preferred uh, for the Neanderthals? Mm -hmm. um, so if you would think about how DNA behaves in us, it constantly mutates. DNA is a a string of biochemical letters which change by errors because there are errors and mistakes happening everywhere. So we tend to accumulate 
mutations or our DNA does. And some of those mutations then get passed to our, to our children. Um, most, if you would look at the total amount of mutations that accumulate in a human that are then potentially passed to their children, most of them do nothing biologically. They just change a letter in the DNA and nothing happens. Uh, a tiny fraction of those could be beneficial. They could somehow provide some fitness value to, to that individual. Perhaps it can be more he or she can be more resistant to diseases. Uh, he or she can reproduce more easily over someone who doesn't have that mutation. So these are beneficial mutations. But then there are non-trivial number of mutations, which are so-called, we call them deleterious because they have negative impact on, on the biology of that individual. Um, for instance, that individual is less likely to reproduce. And this could really be only half a percent or 100% lower chance of reproducing. Uh, but if you would zoom out and stop looking at individual one person reproducing, perhaps uh, having offspring, and you would look at the population as a whole, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, the thing that acts on those individual mutations based on whether they're positive or negative is called natural selection. That is the thing that affects how mutations either spread out in a population if they are good or are wiped out by natural selection if they have some negative impact. And now what is really important is that natural selection is something that acts over thousands of years, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years. And the interesting thing about natural selection is the fact that it is less effective at weeding out those bad mutations in populations that are small. And it's more effective in populations that are big. Uh, I think maybe one easy example is sometimes you hear or read articles about some group of animals being endangered, having very small population size and having some increased amount of bad mutations. So this is a something this is something we know about evolution that how effective natural selection is in removing bad mutation depends on uh, on how big the population is. Um, and interestingly, we also know from studying many Neanderthals genomes now that Neanderthals had for hundreds of thousands of years extremely small population size compared to modern human. Uh, we don't know how much exactly, but I don't think people in the field would be outraged if I said that they had 10 times smaller effective, so-called effective population size than modern humans who lived at the same time. And now, again, if you had a time machine and you could go back 200,000 years and you could sequence a Y chromosome of a Neanderthal man who lived at that time and a modern human man, because Neanderthals had such a small population size, you would expect on average that Neanderthal Y chromosome would have more bad mutations than the modern human Y chromosomes. Simply because over hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, Neanderthals would accumulate more bad mutations. So this is a long introduction, just to say that based on all these arguments, we would expect Neanderthal Y chromosomes to be um, the correct term in, in the field of population genetics is that they would have higher deleterious load of those bad mutations. And now the simple thing is if you then take modern human Y chromosomes and put them into the Neanderthal population due to population interaction and mating, uh, what you would expect that natural selection would that, would that in Neanderthals prefer the modern human Y chromosomes over the, the Neanderthal Y chromosome, simply because of this abstract concept of modern human Y chromosomes having a higher fitness 
And again, over extended maybe 200,000 years since that admixture, we believe, uh, and we did some computational modeling on how you would expect modern humans, uh, modern human Y chromosomes to spread throughout Neanderthal population to eventually completely replace the Neanderthal Y chromosomes that were in the Neanderthals originally. So um, that comes back to your original question when you said that you actually did not sequence the Neanderthal Y chromosomes. And we believe that this is exactly the reason why that happened. Um, unfortunately, all the three Neanderthals that we sequenced, their Y chromosomes that we sequenced, are from the very latest population of Neanderthals that ever lived. Uh, so we don't have uh, an example of a Neanderthal that lived way before, uh, before that um, mixing of populations. If we had that, we could maybe compare those Y chromosomes to each other. But uh, as it is now, we only see the final uh, outcome of actually not having the original Neanderthal Y chromosomes, but having a, almost like a, a snapshot of uh, what a modern human like Y chromosome looked like hundreds of thousands of years ago before it got stuck in the Neanderthal population. So again, to just summarize, natural selection, we believe, is the, is the reason for why those modern human Y chromosomes were replaced. I wanted to like kind of understand how you guys knew it was like natural selection and not, not sort of like random drift. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the evidence for that is actually coming from something else than just the Y chromosome. Uh, there is a, a second type of uh, DNA locus in the modern human genome, and then that is a mitochondrial DNA. Unlike the Y chromosomes, which are male-specific, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited um, through the maternal lineage. And when people in our group over actually 20 years now sequence many more uh, mitochondrial DNAs, they discovered that mitochondrial DNAs are much more closer, uh, Neanderthal and mitochondrial uh, DNA is much more closely related to modern human mitochondrial DNA than the mitochondrial DNA of the Nisalans, which is something we might um, talk a little bit later. And unlike the, unlike the Y chromosomes, Y chromosomes for which we don't have an example of a Neanderthal Y chromosome that um, existed much sooner or much earlier than the gene flow that we think have happened, has happened. Uh, we do have that for the mitochondrial DNA. So there is a group of Neanderthals, which is very old. It's thought to be around 400,000 years old. Um, they lived in Cima de los Huesos site in Spain today. And when people sequenced the mitochondrial DNA of these very old Neanderthals, they discovered that they are not actually related to later Neanderthals mitochondrial DNA. And the only explanation for why that happened is that, again, the mitochondrial DNA was introduced from modern humans into Neanderthals and completely replaced, again, the original mitochondrial DNA. So that's argument one. We have for the mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA, example of a snapshot at several hundred thousand years ago and something that is much more recent. Uh, and from other sources of evidence, we think that the amount of gene flow, the you could say the proportion of modern humans and Neanderthals that made it uh, was relatively low. It was, it's hard to say exactly, but maybe three or 5% proportion of gene flow. That is 5% of modern humans and 95% of Neanderthals. And to see a complete replacement, 
by pure genetic drift, if you would start from a frequency of only 5%, is, it's not impossible, but it's only 5% probability. If you start from a certain level of, of um, a frequency of a locus, this might be getting a little too technical. But if you start in a population at a certain level, let's say 5% of that mitochondrial DNA, then to see that mitochondrial DNA starting from those 5% random drifting to complete replacement is 5%. That is not impossible, but it's fairly unlikely. Um, now to say the same thing for the Y chromosome, which would also be expected to start at a very relatively low frequency of 5%, and then also drifting to fixation by pure chance, the probability of both of these events happening at the same time is again, not impossible, but is extremely unlikely. Uh, if you take a small number, multiply it by a small number from basic probability, the overall probability is even lower than that. And uh, natural selection, given that we already know from other studies that it was less effective in Neanderthals, it's not that we had to invent a new model. It's more like uh, what we already know about the past history of Neanderthals and modern humans leads to itself to the natural selection as a more likely explanation. And uh, if, you, if you read the paper, which is quite technical on its own, we had to juggle a bit a little bit about, because you can never completely rule out that it was just drift. But based on just the probabilities alone, and based on what we know about Neanderthals having less effective selection compared to modern humans, the natural selection itself is um, is a more natural explanation, almost. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, that's an excellent point. Uh, the drift is something that was not really considered for the mitochondrial DNA previously, because as I said, what we found out about those Y chromosomes pretty much mirrors what we have found out five years ago about their mitochondrial DNA. It's just when we were dealing just with the mitochondrial DNA and is it drift, is it selection? The drift was the neutral, the baseline, the baseline scenario. But if you bring the Y chromosomes into picture, I think it's time that we have to consider the fact or the possibility that DNA doesn't really behave neutrally. Um, natural selection is always doing its uh, job. It's always acting. And uh, to explain the complete replacement of Neanderthal Y chromosomes with a selection, is um, currently the simpler model how to explain things. Otherwise, we would have to explain how can two different pieces of DNA, the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes, drift to fixation, to complete replacement just by pure chance alone. It's hard to explain in uh, considering that we think the, the encounters and the mating between Neanderthals and modern humans was really skewed more towards a little bit of modern human gene flow. It would be completely different if we would expect that, that maybe is the easiest way to explain this. If we would think that 10,000 modern humans met 10,000 Neanderthals and they simply random made, merged into a single population, right? In that situation, you would, in the next generation, in a sort of abstract thinking, when we think about these things in terms of a mathematical model, we tend to think in something happening in a single generation and then following that model uh, over time. So if equal proportion of modern humans and Neanderthals met, uh, you would expect the modern human Y chromosomes in the next generation to be at 50% frequency. That I think makes sense if you take 50-50 mixture. 
In that case, drift would be perfectly acceptable uh, scenario that for starting from 50% to go all the way to 100%, it would not be really surprising. But we think that it mostly is that the initial frequency was very low, maybe 5 3%, I think. But it's hard to rule out uh, completely the alternative scenario. Um, when we, if we get ever more data, which we luckily always have, that's how science usually progresses, then it might be a little bit easier to narrow down how strong that selection was. Because as I mentioned right now, we only have examples of three Y chromosomes uh, at the very end, just before they went extinct. If we had Y chromosomes, 100,000 years ago, 120, 150, we could trace how, how uh, fast did the modern human Y chromosome, uh, y chromosome spread throughout the population. Hopefully it will happen soon enough. Uh, so these Y chromosomes that you did find, um, how are they preserved? Like, uh, like what was the situation in which those uh, samples were so that they were able to be preserved? Um, generally speaking, so DNA degrades quickly when the temperature is high or relatively high, when the humidity is high. So it's very difficult to get DNA that's very old from bones, from a jungle or from a tropical environment. The um, three Neanderthals that we sequenced, uh, were all from cave environment, which is always a little bit cooler than, than the outside. Uh, I guess the fact that they are buried uh, or under layers of, of dirt helps the preservation. I don't think anyone knows or can determine just by looking at the site, at the profile of the temperature and humidity, whether there will be DNA surviving in a bone or not. You, can, you always have to try uh, often, if you take a single bone and you drill in one spot, get DNA, try to get DNA, you find nothing. And if you drill two centimeters elsewhere, you find the DNA. So even within a single bone, it's very difficult to, to tell. But all three Neanderthal sites and the Denisovan site, where we got the Denisovan Y chromosomes, are all caves. Denisova cave in, is in Siberia, in, in Altai mountains, um, high elevation, so temperature is cool there. I think that's just pretty much the reason why we could do this. Also, uh, development of technical methods that can make the DNA extraction more efficient, but um, I would say it's, it's mostly the, the environment and the age. None of them are older than 100,000 years. The oldest human DNA sequence, I think it's 400,000 years. That's the current borderline. The oldest DNA sequence ever sequenced is from a 700,000 year old horse from permafrost. So that's, that's quite easy. If you take it out of the freezer, then the DNA survives. But the limits are mostly temperature, humidity, and age. So, um, Nevertheless, uh, you were able to observe the Neanderthal Y chromosome. Uh, can you describe the process behind how you were able to do this? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there is a limit to how well the DNA uh, is preserved. But one thing that I didn't mention is that when you... Um, so the way the process generally works, you have a bone or a tooth. And with a dentist drill, you drill a couple of milligrams or dozens of milligrams of bone powder. And then you release the DNA out of, the, uh, out of that powder in the lab. Uh, but frustratingly, for, for bones that are very old, most of the DNA that you get out of this is not human at all or not Neanderthal at all. Um, because when the individual dies and the bones are deposited in the ground, microbes, bacteria, and fungi invo invade that specimen 
And so most of the DNA that you that you then get out of this is not is microbial. It's something you don't care about. Uh, and that is actually what I mentioned at the beginning, that most of the well-preserved fossils were from females. The male fossils were extremely contaminated by the microbial DNA. So if you were to send this DNA to the sequencing facility, you would be burning tens of thousands of dollars on sequencing DNA you don't care about just to get tiny bits of modern human or, or Neanderthal DNA in this case. Um, luckily for us, uh, uh, Matthias Meyer, who is a scientist here at our institute, who developed, uh, who develops methodology, biochemical methods to get DNA out of all the older and older specimens. He's the one who sequenced DNA of this oldest Neanderthal ever sequenced. They found uh, or developed a method which is based on an idea that if you get this pool of DNA out of the bone, most of it being microbial, what Matthias and his team can do is design a short DNA probes, which can be then quite literally used as a fish hook to fish only the DNA out of that mixture that you care about. So we can design short pieces of DNA probes that are similar to the Y chromosome sequences that we care about. And then the way DNA works is you have one strand of DNA and a similar complementary strand and they can get attached to each other. They can anneal. And then you can use this fishing to just take out the DNA that you care about and discard the microbial DNA. So which this is called the DNA enrichment procedure. And when we sequenced uh, or when we get the DNA out of the mixture in this way, we just send it to a, a sequencing machine, which basically takes those short DNA molecules, which are maybe 50 individual DNA bases or DNA letters long, and sequence those and analyze those in the computer. So that's how, that's how it works. The key was to take the DNA that's heavily contaminated and use biochemical methods that can fish out the, the Neanderthal DNA. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And this is actually, sometimes you read in the news uh, articles mentioning the ancient DNA revolution, how we can now have studies with not just dozens, but sometimes even thousands of ancient human sequence. And this is this DNA enrichment procedures is how we can do it. Um, avoiding this issue of contamination, which is the biggest problem for us. Okay, yeah, um, that makes sense. Uh, through sequencing the Neanderthal DNA, you found that uh, they were more similar to humans than Denisovians, which you mentioned briefly earlier or you mentioned Denisovians briefly earlier on, um, uh, who were the Denisovians in the first place? And wh why was that uh, discovery surprising? Um, so I mentioned that Neanderthals are evolutionary relatives of modern humans uh, that went extinct. Denisovans are a different groups or are a different group of humans that went extinct and is first of all related to modern humans also, but they are sister group to Neanderthals. So a lot of what we do here is, is in the context of so-called phylogenetics, which is the analysis or, or the field of analyzing evolutionary trees, uh, how are species related to each other and uh, who is related closely to more closely to whom than to another group. So in case of the humans that we talk about, we know that Neanderthals and Denisovans were a sister group. So they were closely related to each other. And modern humans, so us, were the more distantly related evolutionary cousins of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, Denisovans themselves, I mentioned how Neanderthals were discovered as a skeletons uh, beautifully preserved all over Eurasia. 
Denisovans are much more trickier in this sense because I think about 10 years ago, a, a tiny pinky uh, bone was discovered in uh, Siberia, in uh, Denisova cave. And I think just by looking at this pinky, it would be hard to say who it belonged to. Um, but DNA actually revealed uh, that it's not a modern human, it's not a Neanderthal, but it's a completely different group of human who was never found before. We didn't know what these people looked like. Actually, we still don't know what they looked like, but we just know they were closely related to Neanderthals. And based on the DNA that we got out of, out of the bones uh, or some tooth, uh, teeth of the Nisimans. And so the way evolution works is that it mostly or broadly follows the three uh, relationships, right? If I sequence a bone of a Neanderthal and a Denisovan, I know that these two are more closely related. They would fall a so-called clade, a group that's related to each other. And modern humans would be a third group that is more distantly related to both of them. Uh, so if you would sequence their Y chromosomes, there's no reason not to think that they would follow the same pattern, that Y chromosomes of ne Neanderthals and Denisovans would be uh, related to each other, and modern human Y chromosomes would be more distantly related. But as I explained the story uh, in, uh, in a little bit earlier, this is exactly not what we found. We found that Neanderthal Y chromosomes are more related to, more closely related to modern humans than to the Um So I guess my previous explanation uh, spoiled this a little bit, because normally you would, the narrative would be that based on what we know from previous studies, Neanderthal Y chromosomes should be more closely related to Denisovans than to modern humans. And look, this is not what we see. Um, and from various other sources of evidence, we see that it's because Neanderthal Y chromosomes were actually replaced by the modern human Y chromosomes. And the Denisovan Y chromosomes, it's interesting uh, that the Denisovan Y chromosomes are so different. Uh, if, if that is because modern humans did not interact with Denisovans that much or they did not introduce the Y chromosomes to that population. It's, we don't know that, but uh, this was the biggest surprise because when we sequenced those Y chromosomes, we just thought they will recapitulate, recapitulate what we know from other sources of evidence. But this was a big surprise to find that uh, Denisovan Y chromosomes are so different especially because that is the same thing we found for the mitochondrial DNA as well. So uh, it's quite interesting that um, what I like to think about is that, the, that what we really sequenced is some sort of early version of a modern human Y chromosome that got stuck in Neanderthals, as I already mentioned. What was the story of the Denisovans in this uh, context? We don't know yet because we just sequenced two of them, two Denisovan Y chromosomes. But uh, hopefully, uh, as we learn more about them, we will know more about Denisovans. Uh, right now, they were found in the Denisova cave, which is where they got their name from and a, a place in Tibet today. So unlike Neanderthals, where, which we found pretty much everywhere in Eurasia, Denisovans are a, still a big mystery. Okay, um, so I had another question. It, it might be like backtracking a little bit, but once the, the human Y chromosome appeared in Neanderthals, do we know if that had anything to do with why Neanderthals went extinct or did that actually like improve their chances of, of survival? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if, if that contributed somehow to their extinction because I guess you could parse it in, in different ways. Uh, 
based on what we see, we think that this gene flow or this admixture uh, happened maybe around two or 300,000 years ago. And we know that Neanderthals disappeared around 40,000 years ago. So there is a lot of time during which they seem to have been doing quite fine. Um, but to come back to our discussion about the natural selection, if the replacement was not just drift, as you suggested, which is totally viable, and it was natural selection driving that replacement, then it's fair to say that the modern human Y chromosomes were somehow adaptive. Uh, one thing about Y chromosomes is that by definition, they make males males. So they are directly responsible for producing offspring. You could make a case that they are the most important thing for producing offspring if they are making uh, or if they are uh, responsible for fertility. So that's something I'm not, I don't have enough data for, so I can't really make stories that the modern human Y chromosome somehow help Neanderthals survive if their Y chromosomes were doing badly in comparison. But based on purely the computational model, that model predicts that the modern human Y chromosomes were adaptive. What would happen to Neanderthals if that introgression did not happen is, is something that's still, that's impossible to say based on this data. Um, but how and why they actually disappeared around 40,000 years ago, we don't know. My personal pet theory is they were not, ex they did not uh, go extinct. They just became absorbed in modern humans. Uh, but that's maybe just my uh, positive way of, of uh, thinking about this, that uh, as modern humans spread around the world, they just absorb the populations that lived there. Um, there could be other people who made a different case. Uh, it, whether that they went extinct and this was cultural, modern humans outcompeted them, or it was biological, maybe that selection process in Neanderthals made them less biologically fit. Uh, to survive in the competition is, I guess that still after 10 years or 20 years of doing ancient DNA research, there is no indication of knowing how and why they went extinct. Um, you could even say that this argument, if it was not biological, uh, would have to be answered by some archaeology study culture how um because we certainly know that that these two groups of humans uh interacted they exchanged culture sometimes you see neanderthals making stone tools and artifacts that seem to be um the these ideas were taken from modern humans hard to say uh, i don't think y chromosomes personally had a lot of a uh, big role in this, but it could be that some sort of biological um, model uh, could explain their, uh, the uh, extinction of Neanderthals. Yeah, I, I personally subscribe to what, what you said, because you see a lot of um, people who are living today who follow like ancient Neanderthal culture, or Neolithic culture, like the what's it called, the Balangoda man in, in Sri Lanka and people and things like that. Um, so it, it seems likely that, that they were sort of absorbed, but I just wanted to see what, what you thought. Um, so finally, I wanted to ask you about what this all means for modern day man and our origins. The, hmm, what does it all mean? Um, I would say that, I guess there could be, uh, um, some sort of objective, um, statement, but personally, uh, 
I like to think that I guess modern humans or us tend to think about ourselves as something special or exceptional just because we are still around and we are doing so well. Uh, what helped me a lot or what changed my view was the realization that there were so many different groups of humans not that long ago, actually. Uh, and um, that the fact that they are not around anymore does not necessarily have to do anything with modern humans or our ancestors being in any way better. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, but that's really more like a personal, almost a philosophical statement about human exceptionalism or not, uh, which I probably not something you asked about. In terms of real biology, there is a ton of things we could learn from those Y chromosomes themselves. Uh, y chromosome in humans today is really heavily studied because it's effect on fertility or infertility. Uh, there is a lot of diagnostic being done and medical work to explain uh, problems with reproduction. Uh, and having an example of a Y chromosome that is tens of thousands of years old and experience maybe a couple of hundreds of thousands of years of uh, independent evolution is a great promise of being able to explain a lot of the biological variation that negatively affects uh, reproduction in, in people today. Uh, unfortunately, the Y chromosomes that we sequence are still, it's, I, I understand them more like a first draft of what is possible uh, in near future, rather than being able to study them for medical purposes. But right now in our institute, there are already many, many more Y chromosomes of Neanderthals being sequenced to a much higher quality. And one of the plans for that is to use those for a more biological study, what we call fun functional biology. So looking at individual changes, comparing what we see in Neanderthal Y chromosome to what is in people today or what is not seen in people today and finding some correlation that could potentially explain how Y chromosome behaves. Because historically, Y chromosomes had this bad reputation of being a junk piece of DNA that maybe will even get lost after millions of years, there will be no Y chromosomes around. Uh, I don't think that is, that is no longer true uh, at this point. And uh, hopefully the fact that we have Y chromosomes of two different kinds of humans will allow a completely different way of looking at, at uh, horse chromosomes. I mean, actually, I'm even, I'm pretty sure this will allow a completely new way of looking at these things. So for from biological perspective, it's pretty clear from this philosophical perspective. I just like to think about humans not, when I went to school 20 years ago now, or 25 years ago, we learned human evolution as this linear progression of humans. You saw these pictures, ape-like crouching man, slowly being upright and making more sophisticated tools. Uh, that is not true anymore. We, saw, we see that human evolution is not linear. It's not being progressing towards uh, some better state. If you would now plot or draw the relationships between different classes of humans that lived over half a million years of past history, you would see mixtures everywhere. Wherever humans met, they interacted, they had offspring together, potentially lived together, uh, mixed. Uh, so yeah, coming back to my philosophical uh, musings again, what I like to think about is human evolution being a 
a network of interconnected things rather than some sort of independent lineages, uh, some disappearing because they went uh, extinct or were out competed, uh, others, the only one which is us surviving to the present. So I guess I would, yeah, finish with a philosophical note. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, that's about all of the questions I had. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, that was one of the most fun conversations I've had in a long time. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. It was my pleasure. I uh, became a huge podcast addict during the pandemic. Uh, I didn't used to listen to podcasts at all, so it's a great honor. And it's really exciting to be on the interview site for the first time ever. So thank you for having me and thank you for being interested in my work. It's scientists generally spend so much time talking just to other scientists that it's podcasts like yours are a great way for us to talk to uh, people who don't do science and are still interested in it. And even just based on the story aspect of the thing and how the past humans lived, it's it's great. It's fun thing to talk about. So I'm glad that I had the chance to uh, to talk to you. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe so you never miss another podcast. We'll see you next time.